welcome the director of media and entertainment for HP, Rick Champagne. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Rick. And thank all of you. Really appreciate you being here. How many of you know how long HP has been coming to Supermeet? Any guesses? Eight years. We've been coming here eight years. This is personally my sixth super meet um, worldwide. So I've also been to two Amsterdam, four of them here in Las Vegas. Really excited to be here. Super meet for us um, is, is something of uh, a passion. We love coming here because we love interacting with all of you. We love hearing your stories when you come out to the booth. So thank you for that. Thank you for welcoming us as part of the community. So Super Meet um, is about the community, obviously, but also about great prizes. So we're going to talk about both of those things tonight. At the end of this session, I'm going to give out the very first door prize tonight. We also are fortunate enough to have another gift from NVIDIA, so they're going to be also helping us with a Quadro M6000. So thank you very much to NVIDIA. All right. So the HP story goes back a very long way. We started over 75 years ago in media and entertainment. Our very first customer was the Walt Disney Company. They bought an audio oscillator that they used in the live production of Fantasia. Bill and Dave started the Silicon Valley when they sold that very first product. So they've been thinking about innovation and creation this whole time. And that's deep inside the roots of HP. It's something that's very close to our heart. We live and breathe this every single day. I don't know if you know this story, but Steve Jobs actually called up Bill Hewlett and asked him for some spare parts for some computer stuff he was working on. And Bill, and he was 12 years old at the time, Bill picked up the phone and he said, yeah, I'd love to help you with that. And he actually gave Steve Jobs a summer internship to work on the very products that he was asking for. So we have a long legacy in media and entertainment. We have a long legacy of innovation and passion for the industry. And we continue that today. In 2015, you may have heard that our dream color displays won an Academy Award in scientific and engineering. It's a legacy of the dream color. Thank you very much. And we have our dream color architect here, and he'd love to talk to you more about dream color. And we're going to tell you a bit more about that in a bit. So with that, we also keep track of the industry. We keep our finger on the pulse. We work very closely with our advisory councils. We have one in Los Angeles with film customers there. We have one in London, Soho. And we also have additional councils that we do in other cities um, to help guide the future of our products. We work very closely with our customers, and there's a lot of customer-driven innovation that comes out of that. And we keep track of the industry trends. So we know that ultra-high resolution is something that is not on the in the future here. It's happening now. I was talking to Sky the Television out of the UK at NAB, and they were on a panel talking about how they've moved to H uh, UHD for all of their broadcast. So, um, and, and it's not just Sky. It's happening everywhere, and you're probably feeling this too. And so we think about this when we're creating our products. And we also think about high frame rates. So things are being shot at higher and higher frame rates. Um, if you recall, we had Brain Farm out on stage a while back. They shoot at 120 frames per second with 4K red footage. So this is something that you know, we need to help you with. And we also think about VR. So how many of you are thinking, also think about VR Anybody? Yeah, wow, that's impressive. 360 video? Yeah, even more. It takes a lot of horsepower to do that. Stitching, you know, when you unwrap a 360 video, shooting at high resolution could be anywhere from 18 to 24K. So HP is here to help you deal with those challenges, and we partner with NVIDIA to do all of that. So an HP Z workstation, so I'm just going to take you through a little bit of education so that you really understand what's in our DNA. So we have a lab in Fort Collins, Colorado. That's where we're headquartered for HP workstations. 
We have this very intense process that we take all of our products through. We have shake and shock machines. We have a material sciences lab that tests every single component that comes in, even when we're working with third-party manufacturers, to make sure that the quality is of the most, the highest possible quality that you can get. We also have a 10-meter chamber that looks like Cerebro, where we have all kinds of instruments pointing at it to measure everything you can possibly measure, from emissions to to sound, because we know that when you're in an edit bay, you want a really quiet machine. So the other thing that we do is we, we superheat them, we supercool them, we put them at altitude. In, in Fort Collins, we're actually 5,000 feet on the ground. So you know, we put them through everything you can possibly put them through, and we surpass military spec standards with our workstations. So that's part of the core of it, obviously, is the quality. Performance, partnered with NVIDIA, is the other part of it. And then we take all of that and we certify it with software partners. So we certify and test with Avid, with Media Composer and Pro Tools. We certify and test with uh, Autodesk, so Maya, 3ds Max, Flame. In fact, Flame um, has a deep integration with our workstations. And we also work with Foundry on Nuke and Nuke Studio. They just announced at the show that Nuke Studio has certified one workstation. And so it's the HP Z840 with the NVIDIA Quadro cards. So that was big news for us. It took, uh, it took a long time to get to that to make sure that the quality was there. And so the other thing that we do is, uh, and Adobe, of course. So Premiere Pro is a favorite of ours, and so is um, After Effects. So we test with all of the Adobe Creative Cloud suite. So, so that's also part of the core of our DNA. And so we hired Jan Ozer, who wrote a book about Premiere Pro. You may know Jan. And we wanted to know what the truth was about performance between the two. We knew we could beat it just based on current, current hardware standards and what the latest CPUs and GPUs and, and, um, and you know, um, storage was. But when Jan reported back all of his findings on the tests that he did, we were, we were overjoyed. And so we published a white paper. And then after that, what we did was we did a video. And some of you may have seen that. We, 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 got, we got some cheers, and we got, we got people who were also, um, maybe it was a bit too in your face. So, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a great video in that I can promise you, I was there on set. And, I, and literally, the people who came out to do the tests live, in person, were not actors. Watch the video. If you just YouTube search on Mac uh, Pro versus Z840, you'll find it. And we're showing it out there if you want to see it. But the first time they knew what they were there for, they knew they were going to be on camera. They knew they had to be video editors. And the first time they actually saw what was happening was when they walked through the door. And then, of course, they got to test it for themselves. But we wanted you to test it for yourself. We didn't want you to just believe the video that HP published. So if you come out, we have a fully maxed out Mac Pro. So everything in it, as much as you can do with it, versus a mid-range HP Z840. And you, you can see for yourself what the difference is between the two. And in fact, my apologies to NVIDIA, but we're using the last generation, a single, uh, Quadro M6000 GPU. So if we were to use today's P6000 or P5000, we'd do even better. So, but come and see that. So here are just some of the specs that you can see from that, uh, from that white paper. But we, we have the printed white paper. You can go through and see everything for yourselves. So some pretty dramatic uh, performance increases you'd get. And of course, if you are concerned about Windows versus Mac, this is what Premiere Pro looks like in both. So, <laughs> and so if, again, these are just specs, so I don't want to bore you with that. So just at a high level, we can double the processors, we can, we can do 10 times the RAM, we can do three, up to three NVIDIA Quadro cards. Do you all know that uh, NVIDIA helped with the Mercury playback engine? and it's optimized for NVIDIA Quadro graphics cards. So that's something that really helps us get that advantage, too, is with the NVIDIA GPUs. We also have ultra-fast 
storage. So you all know what an SSD is, a two and a half inch SSD with the ribbon cable into your computer. Um, maybe you've swapped out one in the past uh, to, you know, to go from a hard drive to SSD. Well, what, what we have in the Z Turbo drive is like, it looks like a RAM chip. It's called an M.2 module. We put that on a card that goes into a PCIe slot in your computer. You don't have to think about this when you order it. But it actually does four times the speed of a standard SSD. The SSD is not the bottleneck, so four times the speed. But then we took four of those and put them on another card. And with that, we're able to get up to nine gigabytes per second read speeds off of that drive. If you want to edit 8K raw uncompressed, you need that kind of storage. This is like the kind of performance that you can't get anywhere else. So that's a major advantage, and we've got lots of others, and we'd be happy to talk to you about that. We also have some mobiles. They're called the ZBooks. This is our high-end workstations. HP's got lots of other uh, mobiles and, and stuff that you see at Best Buy or, in, in, uh, or on the online and that sort of thing. But these are our workstations. These are the professional class products that feature NVIDIA Quadro graphics, which again is all about quality build, and it's also about the certifications. And I'll tell you a bit more about that. But we've got, we just announced at the show that we have a mobile that's VR capable. So you can have a Quadro P, P5000 in that. You can have 64 gigs of RAM. I mean, crazy, crazy uh, laptop. It's a bit thick and heavy, I'll, I'll be honest. But, um, and then we also have our VR ready workstation. So a bit of education for you. Maybe you didn't know that. We have workstations that have been tested with the Oculus Rift, with the HTC Vive. In fact, we sell the HTC Vive Business Edition as a third-party option, so you can, you can get that through HP as well if you wanted to. So that's pretty exciting for us. Um, one thing I'll warn you about with um, VR at NAB or any other show is make sure people are cleaning the glasses. You do not want ocular herpes. It's something that takes a while to go away. It's not pleasant. Practice safe headsets, honestly. <laughs> really, truly. So we also um, introduced our dream color display, the Z31X. True Cinema 4K. This is 4096 by 2160. It's a 10-bit panel, 99.4% coverage of DCI P3. It also has a 1500 to 1 contrast ratio. Um, gorgeous display. We have it out here. Highly stable off-axis black. So if, you, if you're editing, you're inviting someone to come and do an over-the-shoulder review, client attend session, that sort of thing, everybody gets a great viewing experience uh, with, with that display. We also paid attention to design. If you come out and see the products, you'll see that. We also have an integrated colorimeter. So if you want to calibrate your display every 100 hours of runtime, you can program it to do that. You just set the timer for that. You can also program it to do it every three weeks, every four weeks, whenever you want, Monday night, 2 AM. It'll turn itself on. It'll warm itself up. The calibration, it's an XYZ colorimeter, will come down, calibrate your display, pop up, turn itself off. You can also schedule it so that if you start probably at 10 AM every day, you can schedule it to turn on at 9.30 warm itself up and be ready for you to do color critical work the second you walk in that door. Beautiful display, you've got to see this. It also has a built-in KVM, so if you have a MacBook and you have an HP Z840, you can plug them both into this display. Quick key to swap between the two. It's built right into the display. Super powerful, um, and that was the KVM right there. So of course, great displays need great graphics. We partner with NVIDIA for that. All of our workstations um, have NVIDIA Quadro graphics. We go across the entire line, typically in an editorial, color grading, compositing, VFX, motion graphics scenario. These are the GPUs that we work with the most. Um, and the difference between these and consumer graphics of any kind is that Quadro has the best build quality. It's built by NVIDIA. It has all those certifications, just like the workstations. And it also uh, typically has at least double the frame buffer. So if you're doing, um, if you're shooting with a Nokia Ozo, 2K cameras, eight of them, that's 16K unwrapped, um, the frame buffers on these are much larger, so you can, you can deal with larger files right in the GPU, super fast that way. 
um, uh, in some cases, more cores. Um, also, uh, there's a myth out there that you, you, you might need a consumer gaming card uh, to do something like VR. This is not the case at all. Um, if you're doing content creation, you need the biggest, best, fastest that you have. And if you go to the SPEC APC website, this is an industry standard body, they will show you that the benchmarks between consumer graphics and pro graphics, like NVIDIA Quadro, specifically NVIDIA Quadro, is much faster. This is a, a truth by a third party um, thing. So it kind of, it's one of those things, you know, um, I get the question, but it really, um, it's been tested and, and we have the numbers to show it. So NVIDIA also has a complete VR platform. It looked like a lot of people were really interested in that. So they, they do have the GPUs, but they go much further than that. There is the software, so that's one thing that we do with our workstations, is we make sure that um, we have something called Performance Advisor built into every single workstation. It will look and see, oh, you have Premiere Pro on this system. This is the driver you need to use. This is the latest driver that was tested with Adobe and with NVIDIA. So, and you can press the button to download right now. So this is the kind of experience that you get with a workstation and with an NVIDIA Quadro GPU. They also have, so the driver's obviously very stable, and they're there to make sure that the experience that you have is a professional experience. We have three-year warranty service parts. If something goes wrong with your system, someone will come and replace it. I mean, it's, um, it, it's built for professional workflows and workloads. And so, and then of course, there's VR Works, which is a complete ecosystem of APIs and tools that you can use to develop to do uh, large format displays, to do stitching, to do um, uh, caves, if that's what you want to do, but also uh, to make sure that you get the best performance when you have a VR experience. So that was just a little bit of what I wanted to share with you. We're all here to also educate ourselves. Maybe you didn't know about that. Maybe you didn't know Premiere Pro was CUDA accelerated, which is four NVIDIA GPUs. Maybe you didn't know about workstations, what really the difference was between that and an off-the-shelf gaming or consumer PC is. Hopefully, you've learned a little. We want to tell you all about it, and we want to learn about what you're doing. Um, so please come and see us. But now, now is time to give away some cool prizes. Are we ready? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. I think we need a little bit more applause than that. So what we're going to do is everyone who has a white ticket, please stand up. As Rick will pull the ticket, and then Rick will slowly read the numbers one by one. If it's not your number, sit down until there's only one. One ring, one ticket to rule them all. All right, here we go. Here we go. go. Just digging in. And actually, you know what? You didn't see what, if I had anything in that hand. So I'm going to switch hands. Nothing up my sleeve. So this way, we all know we're all in the same boat together here. I'm going to pull out the first ticket. I have the ticket. All right. Six. Yeah. <laughs> Look at us all. We've all got six. Three, <laughs> woo, <laughs> nine, <laughs> all right, four, <laughs> wow, I don't have that many Z2 minis, <laughs> four, <laughs> oh, zero, <laughs> oh, four, <laughs> yeah, all right, you come on up here woo! right now. Quickly, <laughs> go around, walk up the stairs, and we'll just get a quick, quick your name. My name is Brian Roberts. I've been buying tickets for seven years. This is the first time I've won anything. Yeah! All right. <laughs> and this is the first door prize again. He just won. And you just won a Z2 Mini with a Dream Color Z32X color critical nice. display. Not too shabby, I must Not say. Not too shabby. Let's do a quick, uh, a quick uh, photo op here with Dean. Nice. All right. Together, all of us together. Oh. All right. Okay, great. Cool. All right. Thank you. You, you are released. Go back. I need your card. <laughs> you got, oh my, yes. Your business card to oh, mail yes, to you. Yes, I can do that too. All right. 
we're exchanging information now. Excellent. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank now, you. everyone with a white ticket, please stand up once again because we have a bonus round raffle. And again, the, the other door prize will be uh, given away at the regular raffle. So, here we go. Uh, Rick is going to give away. This is an NVIDIA Quadro M6000 24 gigabyte GPU. Awesome stuff right here. All right, and we're gonna roll up the sleeve one more time here. Going in, pulling out the first one. Six! Three! Nine! Four! Oh, yeah. Three! Oh. Six! Seven! What? Hello? Six, three, nine, four, three, six, seven. <laughs> okay, another ticket. Revolt. Very quickly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Six. <laughs> Three. Nine. Four. Four. Seven. Seven. Here we go. Woo! He's running on up. All right, come around quickly on the stairs. Oh, no, 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 this stairs. <laughs> Remember your age. Remember your age. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Make sure. Oh. 639-4477, right? That's the one. That's it. And your name? Mark. Mark Wright. Mark, you have just won this prize. And let's just do a quick photo op right here, looking at that camera. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So everyone, please, who's got a white ticket, hold on to them for the raffle. All right. All right. Um, thank you so much, Dan. Really and appreciate it. thank you. It. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Champagne. Hey there. I am Jim with Digital Anarchy, and we have a new plugin for Premiere Pro for doing automated transcriptions. It's amazingly accurate. It gets up to 96% accuracy, and we do that by using two different uh, speech-to-text services. Uh, one of those gives you 16 hours of transcription per month for free. And the way it works is you select the sequence that in Premiere that has the audio you want to transcribe. You use Transcriptive to select the service that you want to use. And then you select the options that you want, like speaker identification. And then we encode that, we upload that to the cloud, and then we bring down the, your transcript. And once you have the transcript, uh, you can edit it. You can do that with just keyboard shortcuts, so you don't have to take your hands off the keyboard. And this makes for a very fast and efficient way of editing. It's basically a word processor customized for doing transcription. And as you can see, we have speaker identification. It identifies sentences and questions. And you have the time code in there. And so once you have your transcript, you can kick it out as different file types for captions, subtitles, YouTube SEO, and all sorts of uses. And you can also save it out as Premiere markers. So you can see what's being said in the timeline, as well as being able to search it in the markers panel. So if you have an hour-long documentary and you know what was said, but you don't know where it was said, you can search for it in the markers panel, and it'll jump right to the time. And so. It's an amazing solution for doing transcripts. It's going to save you a lot of time. It's certainly a lot cheaper than traditional transcription services. And uh, we're doing demos in, out in the vendor area. We're doing demos in our booth in South Hall, 5228, doing live demos. So you can come record something and see exactly what the results are. And you can also go to digitalanarchy.com. Thanks. Back with us, the CEO of Otherworld Computing, Larry O'Connor. How are we all doing tonight? Having a good show? Looking forward to winning some OWC gear? Really? Okay. 
I'll tell you what, it's great to be back. You know, as always, I mean, we enjoy coming to on our latest Thunderbolt gear. That's kind of been the, uh, the theme the last few years. This year we've got some great Thunderbolt 3 stuff. Our dock, about to ship in a couple of days, our Thunder Base 6, six drives, plus a, an SSD for super accelerated, super redundant storage. But you know, I'll skip all the boring stuff. We've also got our deck here. You know, we kind of put the, the MacBook Pro, put the Pro back in the MacBook. So for those on the field who are missing those ports, you know, come by and look at our booth, you know, 8905. You know, this is, you know, this is why we're here. I mean, we're here to enhance your productivity, you know, make your lives easier, give you products so that you don't have to think about, you know, what you're doing with your technology. You're using your technology to express your creativity. And tonight I have uh, with me uh, Tim Stanley from Softraid and Sarita Contani from Contani Productions that are going to, you know, really share some great information with you, show you some great stuff in terms of, you know, what you can be thinking about and what you ideally won't have to be worried about anymore. And, from there, uh, I will let Tim take it away. So thanks for having us. Have a great show. Hi, I'm Tim Standing. I'm a vice president of software engineering for OWC Holdings. Um, we're a partner with OWC. We do all of the driver development. We also um, have been developing SoftRaid and support SoftRaid. If you, uh, if you ever email SoftRaid for support at 11 o'clock at night and get a response, it's our team who's doing it. Um, so software has been around for 21 years. That's sort of a long time from the software world. I've been working on it for 20. I can't believe that it's gone that quickly. Um, when I first started out, I was like really excited about making drives faster, making volumes faster. I'd stay up at night trying to figure out how to get like that extra millisecond out of a one meg megabyte transfer. Um, and then something happened in 2003. I joined a volunteer fire department, and I started going on fire calls and seeing people's houses that had burned down, and their computers looked like a tin can that had been in a, a campfire. And these people lost everything. They lost their, their photos, they lost their business records, they lost their um, just absolutely everything. And so I really quickly changed my viewpoint on software development from let's make it as fast as possible to let's make it as reliable f as possible first and then make it fast as the second thing. So um, focus on reliability and, and speed comes second. We still work really hard on speed. And if you go to the OWC booth or go out to our table, you'll see this, which is a product that OWC is going to be shipping in July. It does indeed, this is not a Photoshop screenshot, it does indeed do four megabytes a second writing and 4.6 reading. This is um, striping together two of these Vipers that um, OWC is going to ship. They're not going to be outrageously expensive. They're really reliable. They're totally quiet. They have no fan. And they're, they just kick butt. You know, I, I saw this, um, the screen when I first did this test, and I was like super excited. It brought me back to those early coding days when I'd get something to work and be so proud of it. And this is one of those things. The hardware engineer is fabulous. He's using SoftRaid, and this is the result he gets. Um, <clears throat> so go and check it out. It's really cool. It's, I, the, I talked to so many people today who said, oh my god, that can't be true. And it is true. It's actually true. It's going to be shipping in a several months. And um, I think it's really fabulous. So now I'm going to um, switch gears a little bit. I'm going to show you a video. You guys like every other video, you look at video editor, you look at this clip and you go, oh my god, I've got a hardware problem, right? And usually it's a disk drive. And usually when a disk drive fails, it's right when you, it's like right before the client shows up, it's right before you've got to go final. In my case, it always seems to happen like three days before I'm going to ship a major release of SoftRaid. Um, it's, or I'm writing a magazine article and I've got the final edit and my drive goes down. The last thing you want to do is have to change gears, go get stuff off the backup, do a RAID rebuild. You really just want to be focusing on your work, not on your disk drives. Wouldn't it be great if there was some way of getting advance notice that your drive was going to fail? Right? So you could actually schedule. You'd say, oh, my drive is going to fail in like a couple months, so I should, I should schedule a weekend where I can like, re do my RAID rebuild or copy everything off onto the new drive or get a new enclosure, whatever it is, but prepare for the problem. So um, with SoftRaid, anyone who's been using SoftRaid since version 4, which came out in 2010, you know that we've been doing this. We've been warning people that um, drives are unreliable. Please replace it. You've got two months. If you're lucky, maybe only a week. 
Uh, so we first started doing this in 2010. We, we updated it in 2000, um, uh, 2014 when we came up with version 5. We made it a little bit more user friendly. It's still the same basic engine. And it's using um, Smart. Smart is this technology that was put into disk drives about 15 years ago. The whole idea behind it was, hey, the disk drive has a computer in it. It can test itself. It can tell you whether it's good or not. Um, the problem is that it's like, you know, the, the manufacturers don't want to say their drives are bad because if they do, they've got to RMA them and send you a new one and do a free warranty replacement. So they always pass their tests. So the, the smart test itself is pretty useless. But the smart parameters, these things called smart attributes, are counters that are in the drive that we can so use software to pull out. And they're things like how long has the drive been running, how many hours, um, how many times has the how many uh, sectors have been reallocated, how many times has it powered up, all this stuff. And what I found in 2007 was this great study that Google had done. Google had gone through, and two engineers had gone through and set up some code that sucked out all of the smart parameters every 24 hours for all 100,000 drives they had in 2007. And then they waited, and they waited to see when a drive failed. When a drive failed, they looked back in time, and they saw, so is there a smart parameter that changed just before the drive failed? And if there was a smart parameter that changed, they knew that they could possibly use it as a prediction. So they looked for a correlation, and they found three smart parameters that were like just gold for, for predicting when a drive was going to fail. And these are the number of reallocated sectors, the number of unreliable sectors, which are sectors that the drive is about to reallocate but hasn't quite yet decided to reallocate, and the number of times that the drive was completely unable to correct an error end to end. Um, you know, I was a little worried about this data because it's seven, 10 years old at this point, but Backblaze over the last three years has started using the same methodology for, for um, and they've been publishing their results and they've also been publishing the brand of drives. Their, I, hats off to them. Every quarter they put out a blog entry. It lists the drives that are failing. It lists all the, the smart statistics. They've been really open about it. And it's, it's basically um, totally validated our our, build, our model of predicting drive failure. So what we find is um, the drives that, of all the drives that fail, 75% of them are predicted to fail by soft raid a week or a month before they actually fail. This is advanced notice. This is advanced notice you can use to go and buy a new drive and, um, and you know, put it in and schedule a time, have your tech guy put it in, or just schedule a time when it's low stress. You do not want to be doing this an hour before an you know, important client comes in, an hour before an important pitch, or in my case, an hour before you're starting to, uh, to you know, or a day before you want to ship a new version of SoftRate. So um, the, one of the number one requir requests we've had over the last you know, a couple of years is, hey, how about just doing a product that just does this one feature? I want my graphic artist to use it. I want my administrator to use it. I want my IT guy to use it. You know, I don't want to just have to, I don't want to have to buy software to do it. So what we did was we split off all of this um, technology into a new product. And um, yes, it is going to be free. It's called Smart Alec. It, all it does is, it's, it's something I've been dreaming about for two years, so I'm super excited that it's seen the light of day. I love the name. I love the simplicity of it. The goal is that someone who knows relatively little about computers can A, install it, B, run it, and C, know the results. So it's going to be downloadable from the app, Apple's App Store. It's going to be free, as I say. It just runs. It's like a one-trick pony. It does one thing, and it does one thing really well. It just watches your disk drives, uses the same algorithms that we use for SoftRaid. Um, when there's a problem with your disk drive, it'll just pop up a warning thing. There's no like, list of smart parameters expecting you to be a computer nerd and understand them. No, it just says your drive is predicted to fail. You get a um, yellow bar. Your drive is go has already failed. You get a red bar. And then there's, if you need help, there's a form to get help stuff. That's it. You're done. So um, it started public beta on, um, yesterday. You can go to our, um, our, our site and download and apply for the beta copy. We just want to get your email address so we can follow up with you. You can download it. Please use it. I've been using it for a couple of weeks. It's really stable. It has no driver. It's not going to introduce any um, fragility or, or um, you know, instability in your computer.
Okay, um, so with that, I'm going to close. I'm going to introduce Serena Catania. Serena is um, the head of the Catania Group. She's one of the co-founders of um, the Sundance Film Festival. I met her a year ago um, due to a, an absolute horrific thing that happened with all her uh, locally attached storage. I'll let her describe it to you. Um, but she is um, one of the people I've met this year who has incredible passion. And I find Hi. that... I find that passion is really unusual in this world, and I think that people who are really passionate are fabulous, and they really give me life in, in my world oh my and my God. work, and I love having met her. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> you know what? I feel like Beyonce. Do I look like Beyonce? Okay. How many have seen this ticket before? You know what comes with this ticket? You have to say, I am awesome. Can you try it? Can you try it? Because we are. I am awesome. Oh, you can do better than that. Please. One more time. One more time. I am awesome. That's awesome. Good job. So I want to say, Thank you to OWC for sponsoring me. And I'm going to run around on the stage and be out of breath in about two minutes because I love being up here saying hi to all you guys. So this is about riding the storm to success. I can't use the F word because mixed audience. This is how I was raised. I was a military brat. I was told to sit up straight, wear my white gloves, behave, follow the rules. And of course, I didn't. <laughs> Anybody who knows me knows that I don't take no for an answer and I'm very hard to tell me what to do. So how many of you have ever felt like in your career you are nowhere? It's happened to me many times, right? You felt like you were nowhere. Where do I go? Do I keep doing this? Am I going to make a living? Well, I want you to change your attitude. I want you to say, now, here. And that's the theme of tonight. The theme of tonight is about relationships. And it's about living in the now. I was at the 2016 Berlinale, and I was watching a movie called Zero Days by Academy Award winning Alex Gibney. And a year ago, almost to the day, as I was leaving for Supermeet, I had 100 terabytes attached to my computer system, and it all got lost, every bit of it, 100 terabytes. My film, Cowboy Country, a month of filming surviving videos in the, in the uh, jungles of Peru, my film about Keontae's story, a wounded Marine who I'm trying so hard to help get the word out about, everything I had done with Danny Glover in the United Nations, gone two generations of an American family, 10 years of working on that film, actually a series, gone. And my dad, as he was dying, made me a tape as a surprise because he knew I wanted to do the story of his love story, and that was gone too. It was really heartbreaking. So this was what I call the graveyard of some of the drives that got hacked. We started getting some of the stuff back, but it was looking pretty bad, really bad. These are some of the files that started coming back. But I have to tell you that OWC, Soft Raid, and enlisting the help of Drive Savers, a year later, I, it started coming back. And in one partition alone, there was over 350,000 files with no metadata. You guys in this room know how hard that is to call through. But I'm happy to say that a year later, I would say about 80 or 90% of it is back. And could you please help me say thank you to OWC? I love you. I love you. <laughs> All right. So success is not just about us. And this is an example of how important relationships are. The people sitting next to you in this room, the relationship that you have, that's what's important. I was working on a, on a, directing a film for National Geographic about chasing lightning with Tim Samaras and Karsten Peter. And I'm with 
Tim and his wife, it's the middle of the night and we're looking at the black anvil and he says, now I know why I do this. Two years later, he was gone. I worked on a film for Danny Glover with two amazing executive producers and I wrote them this thank you note because they were so great to me during the production and I never sent it. And last year, Dave died. So these are the people that worked so hard for us. This was actually taken on the set of a racing film, eight camera shoot. These poor guys were so tired. We need to take time to think about if we're going to be successful, love the people around you, care about them, respect them, be brave, be creative, but work as a team. So this is a quote that I really like. There are two goddesses in your heart, the goddess of wisdom and the goddess of wealth. Everyone thinks they need to get wealth first and wisdom will come. So they concern themselves with choosing money, but they have it backwards. You have to give your heart to the goddess of wisdom. Give her all your love and attention and the goddess of wealth will become jealous and will shower you and follow you. We are artists. We create beauty and creativity just from scratch. But there's a point in all of our lives, and I know we've all been there, where you've been working so hard, like this movie that I've been working on for 10 years. You've been working so hard, you go, I can't go anymore, I can't go anymore. But you can't look back, because if you look back, everything you will have done prior to that will be gone. Most people who die climbing mountains die within a few hundred yards of the top of the mountain peak because they get so tired they don't think they can go one more step. So I say, bring it on. We need some fresh air. Bring it on. So I thought maybe you guys would like to watch a couple minutes of the film that OWC helped rescue. Do you want to? Okay, please don't judge me, I'm not an editor. Thank God Carlos was there. He helped do a couple quick tweaks, and the grading is, it's not graded yet, uh, and the sound is rough, because we're still looking for the major sound. But anyway, this is it, this is Keontae's story. And uh, Keontae is trying very hard to do whatever he can to help other people with what he has learned. So what's this domino on my seat? I don't know how many of you know what the domino is. I put the domino there. That's a present from me to you. I bought them myself. That's my kids tell me whenever I'm having a hard time to put something in my pocket to remind me that I'm loved. And so give it to somebody who's having a hard time and who needs it. Keep it for yourself. But. I just want you to know that you are awesome and you are loved. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I tell you, it's great to be here. I mean, we're here for you. We're here because of you. Now, we know that every pixel matters, and when it comes to the upgrades you need for inside your systems, like the new Oros for the, the MacBook Airs and the MacBook Pro Retinas that you know, take those 2013 and later machines forward, you, know, you need options. You need to be able to take your technology further. You need to be able to take your creativity further. And storage, you know, external storage, now, yesterday, you know, yesteryear, 500 gigabytes was a lot. 500 megabytes used to be a lot. And now we're talking 32 terabytes and way beyond. Now, it's my privilege to introduce Lewis of 30 Ninjas. He's the VR dude and CTO. He's going to talk about some serious storage needs and some really cool stuff. And Chris, our enterprise storage dude, now, he's, he's got solutions to go way beyond 32 terabytes. You either think 32 or 40 terabytes or 64 terabytes is a lot today. Now, just wait to what you're going to need tomorrow. <laughs> but, but we got you covered. So enjoy and, and thank you. Thank you. Hey, Super Meat, how are you? It's great to be here. I'm also excited that my new title is VR Dude. Um, it's pretty awesome. So, I shoot VR. It's the white hot new thing. Sorry, Ryan, 
Ryan Whitehead, wherever you are. Um, anyway, so the first thing I'm going to do, because everybody is asking everyone, how do you edit VR? How do you tell stories in VR? Da -da 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 -da. I'm just going to show you right away. It's going to be really, really easy. Um, here we go, if this works. So, can you play that video? This is how you tell stories in VR. So now, I'm sorry. It's vertical, it's 2016, let's just get over it. So, laser pointer, cat. But then you have a cut. Oh, and I'm talking as well, apparently, on this video, I apologize. But if you keep your laser pointer here, in view. So watch, I just cut. They pick right up. I'm going to cut again in a second. But if you cut incorrectly behind them, allow your user, you, your user to track. And that, if we can stop that video, is how you cut in VR. You're welcome. Um, Actually, not the end of my presentation, but um, seriously, everybody's telling you that there's all these rules and there's all these, like, this is the right way to do it. Um, haven't apparently ever read a film history book because everybody said the same thing to Lumiere. Everybody said the same thing to Eisenstein, Murnau, Lang. Oh, the train's coming in the tunnel. It'll scare the audience. Or, oh, no, if you cut between the two scenes, people will just get confused. No. Just don't bore people and pay attention to where you think your audience is looking. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe they're not looking there, but watch other people watch your work and you'll figure that out. In the same way with the cat, if I move the laser pointer in front of the cat and I start it in a place where she can see, that's Lola, by the way, she follows the laser pointer. If I point it behind her, she doesn't. She gets bored and walks away. Well, she in this case, she didn't walk away. But in the other video, she, uh, she started cleaning herself. So, um, next slide. So, I'm here to talk about something that actually does have rules and is really daunting and somewhat terrifying in VR. Um, VR cameras are all made of lots of little cameras, which inherently means more data to manage, more data to store, more problems. Also, when you consider that if you're making VR content for a headset, you're dealing with two eyes, you're hopefully dealing with stereo, and when you look at some of the resolution that's required for some of these headsets, particularly, keep, particularly to keep it future compatible and to help you have a legacy-based medium, you're gonna have to be rendering out in incredibly high resolution, usually about 8K, or, oh, sorry, and 60 frames a second. That's to make sure there's a good user experience. So, the next problem about problem with that is most places where you shoot VR are not places that are good for hard drives. I do have a reputation for breaking hard drives and breaking computers because I do things like dump data on a boat and then pour water on it because I took my wetsuit off or, you know, this was the one in the, the photo on the right or I think, yeah, on the right, uh, chicken guts fell into a hard drive I had on set and... That was gross, and it broke. Um, but I took the back off and replaced it. <laughs> um, on the left is shooting sharks, as you can see. So these are places where you're shooting in super volatile scenarios where you need to have redundancy because, I mean, I'm a diver, and I've always been taught that three is actually two, and two is actually one, and one is actually zero. So in a place like that, you really want to capture that shot because that shot is awesome. If I lost just one camera, now I've got this big black hole in the image. So, what do I do? I don't completely know. We thought about going to a tape-based workflow because that's incredibly cheap and very, very strong and it's not difficult, it's very difficult to break, but it's also incredibly time consuming. So I didn't want to do that. Um, so we talked about dumping to multiple drives. That takes a long time, it's fairly cheap if you dump to bare drives. It works out well, but it's also time consuming and I'm also sort of paranoid and have a hard drive that I want to leave in LA and a, a duplicate of that in New York and then, you know, if there is a nuclear attack, like, they're going to take out New York and LA, so I need to have it in some place like Winnipeg as well. <laughs> 
Um, anyway, so here's a picture of, this is again, another great part about capturing VR is you have to hide. And sometimes you're in a place where you might get your camera stolen. So you hide underneath it and have your post house complain when they, you tell them you need to be painted out. Um, this on the right is an example of some of the SD cards. Notice I say some of the SD cards off of a rig I've worked with. On the left is one of my drawers that broke from the weight of all the hard drives in there. <laughs> um, you also have, I also have a situation, so I'm working on a project, it's called Invisible. It's a 30 minute high action narrative VR series. It's insane, it's crazy. It's produced by Samsung, Jaunt, Condé Nast, and my company, 30 Ninjas, with the director, Doug Lyman. You've probably seen his film, Born Identity, or Edge of Tomorrow. It's insane, it's super high action. It's actually really fun to watch. That's something we've been really careful to do, is like, was, is it fun? Do I wanna watch it? Am I bored watching it? Yeah, okay, well then let's cut that part and put something else in. Um, but, it's incredibly high-end, but the way you capture and the way you store is really problematic. Also, to top it off, I have a director who's in LA one day, who's in London the next day, who's in New York the next day, and I'm having to chase him with edits, and I'm having to bring to my post house the molecule in New York City to do the VFX, and then I have a color house in LA, and my partner's in LA. It's really exhausting. And then also, when I'm, you're dealing with a camera that's shooting, you know, we're at 4K, we're roughly 60 gigs a minute, and then if you want to conform in 8K, which is a good idea, you know, you're at 120, something like that, per minute, which is fun when you start doing the math on that and you start shooting, and it really adds up really, really, really fast. I should say, if anybody has questions about any of this stuff, please stop me. Um, so, this is another picture of us. This is us working in Haiti, uh, this, is an, uh, this is a small shot inside of uh, one of the shanty towns there. We were shooting narrative just last week up there. Uh, so one of the solutions I had, we have these Thunder Bays that are, that are pretty great. They're, they're really strong. I like them because you can take the back off of them when you pour things inside of them or when sand gets into them and then you replace the part and you're fine. It's very, very easy. The tool that I need to do that is on my Leatherman. Same with these little shuttle drives. We were using these one terabyte shuttle drives to run drives in between different people. And also have something that could be easily put into a jacket if I'm flying through multiple customs where they get confused by a raid and then I forget the raid keys and they threaten to confiscate it because I can't open up the raid. Um, so you've got, you've got these one terabyte drives. But this is again, this is starting to spread out. How do we, how do we keep track of all that? How do we how do, we do this? Um, it's, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of, a lot of enterprise solutions that we're ultimately going to be looking towards. So, I'm gonna start talking with Chris here. Chris is a good friend of mine. I don't work for OWC, but I'm told he has some amazing solutions for this problem where I'm having to run with multiple partners in multiple cities, lots and lots of data, and you know, looking to do a conform that's 60 frames a second and 8K for 30 minutes long, but that's not the VFX layers. Obviously with a VFX movie, you have multiple layers on a timeline. So really, it's probably like 60 minutes. Chris? <laughs> yes, so. Um, <laughs> How do you help me? A lot of these struggles that you're kind of encountering right now um, are the reasons why we started developing our Jupiter product line. Um, we wanted to really provide a, a super high performance um, scalable, but affordable storage system, uh, or systems, I should say, that, that really lets you um, kind of grow as you need to with, without um, having to really worry about your storage um, and have it to, to track where you put this drive on the shelf or where you put this one in this drawer. We really wanted to, to enable you to be able to centralize everything in one spot, um, have the capability to push it to other locations even, uh, which is something you need to do. Yes. Right? from New York to LA, so New York, it? London, yeah. or LA, mm -hmm. or potentially the Middle East, depending upon where my director is at the time. Yeah. yeah. So, um, we're actually demoing at our booth, we have a Jupiter Callisto system set up, which is, uh, uh, again, highly scalable. We use ZFS inside, has 10 gig ethernet on it, so you get that performance, which is very actually similar to what you're using with the Thunder Bays mm -hmm. that we showed up there, um, 10 gigabit ethernet. So you actually can saturate that and get very, speeds very similar to, to Thunderbolt, which um, 
So if, if you always have that question, like, can I actually do this with networking? Is it fast enough? Well, just think about that. Like, it, it's, it's 10 gigabits. So that's what Thunderbolt, uh, well, first gen Thunderbolt actually was. So if you can do something with a Thunderbolt drive, you can probably do it with a, an Ethernet, a 10 gig Ethernet system. So, um, I mean, that's, that's totally part of the problem as well. It's, you know, I'm, I'm literally running up against drive speeds on this. Yeah. When you're riding at 60 frames a second at 8K, Drive speeds and GPU are an issue. <laughs> yeah, so um, speed is definitely something we have in our systems. I mean, we, we have a focus on building up the back end within the system, so we don't want to skimp with the drives inside and the configuration, so you immediately start getting like a reduction in speed as soon as you have multiple people tackling it. We didn't want that to happen. We wanted to build something that was so powerful behind the scenes that you could have multiple editors coming in and doing things at the same time, and and it would, it would just work. You'd have same fast speeds that, that you would expect as, as if you were just accessing it independently. So um, size-wise, I mean, you're talking like, how many gigs per minute was it? Well, it's not Lytro. Did anybody see the Lytro set up today or the Cadillac camera? 100 gigs, what is it, 100 gigs a second with a mini fridge to, to store it just while you're shooting? Yeah. Pretty cool, pretty that's, cool. That's just nuts. So I'm not shooting that, but we're, we're close to it. <laughs> and it'll just get worse. Yeah. So um, scalability is a key, and uh, we can scale up into the petabytes. Uh, I mentioned ZFS. I'm not going to bore you with all the technical details right now, but I believe it originally stood for zettabyte file system. So, um, What's a zettabyte? Oh, God, is that, is that like a... <laughs> put me on the spot. Man. No, no worries. We'll figure it out in a bit. Tell you what a petabyte is. But there you go, right? <laughs> so, ex expansion into petabytes and theoretically even zettabytes is actually possible with this file system. So That's it's insane. it's kind of like future proofing yourself. Um, and because we're we're kind of using open, well, we are using open source foundations within our system because we don't want to lock you into some proprietary RAID format, right? So. We're basing this, uh, the ZFS off of the OpenZFS project, which is cool because you can take those drives. So if you mentioned if something happens, um, so maybe like a fire happens in the something I mean, location I assume you're I would keep it near yeah. wetsuits. Yeah. So like maybe the power supply fries on a system because it got water splashed on it. You can take those drives out and move them into another system. It wouldn't even have to be ours at that point. Hopefully it is ours. But um, you could plug them in, and it would work. As long as that system can work with ZFS, you're cool. So um, doing some cool stuff. And I'll, I'll stop there before I get into really techy, geeky stuff. Sounds amazing. So. so the next thing I have, we have about five minutes left. Does anybody have any questions about VR capture or VR in general or if you like my cat Lola? <laughs> I like the cat video. I can't hear a word you're saying. Okay, that's a great question. Um, he just asked what we're doing for stitching. So stitching, that's an interesting question. I don't think there's just one answer. There's a number of solutions. I personally prefer Nuke, and the house that I work with prefers Nuke as well. That's the molecule. But, you know, I personally use Autopano as well, a lot in the field. It's very quick. It's very easy. I can render quickly if I'm on my little machine on a boat and I need to make sure that I got the shot so I don't have to go down again, I'll do that, absolutely, instead of setting up a, new, a nuke node tree or something. But there's a number of, the, number of other solutions in the same way that I think in VR, there isn't just one camera solution. I tend to treat cameras like lenses. There's a different post solution for each job. I've seen some amazing stitching come out, just come out of After Effects, actually. I've seen some amazing solutions come out. I saw one of the best stereo renders I've ever seen in my life last night just straight out of PT GUI, which blew my mind. I felt that was like painting the Sistine Chapel with like a toothbrush, but it looked great. So it's whatever works best for you. Um, Nuke does allow for large scale renders and a number of other factors that we found works best for this project. That's a good question. How do you hide it? So we use a Tetra mic, uh, which is an ambisonic microphone, um, along with your traditional labs that you hide. There is no boom, which, boom, which always really, really annoys all of my sound guys. Um, it's a small little Tetra mic that's mounted below the camera. Um, we use that. I have the best sound team in the world, in my opinion. 
um, who just do stuff that completely blows my mind. Um, Tim Guttimer is incredible, and he spatializes sound in ways that I... I mean, it's not just the sound guy thing where they put on the headphones and you're like, what, I don't get it. And they're like, dude, it's so amazing. And then you're like, what? It's not that, it's actually, it's actually different and it's amazing. But yeah, so you hide, you hide it, you just don't, you don't have it. There's no boom. A lot of ADR. Anybody else? Um, that, well, there's, yeah, you absolutely can. So he just asked if, if I can hide under the camera. Um, it does present a larger target to paint out, and it becomes way more annoying to get rid of a dude hiding underneath, underneath the camera. However, there are some instances where either not hiding under the camera means you can't get the shot, or it actually becomes more dangerous to, like, particularly around wild animals. I did, in that shark footage shot you saw there, we, uh, I planted the camera, and ran off and hid behind a rock, um, not realizing that some very large sharks had appeared and started to come out to get my rig and realized that there was a very, very large shark right in front of my face. Um, so I probably should have stayed closer and stayed with an eye line, but it's just, a, I mean, I guess the, the answer for that is, what is your tolerance to painting out? If you are totally cool with painting out everything. You could stand in the shot and direct standing next to them. There are some VR solutions like Ozo that pr provide immediate playback. Um, some people just like being there and hiding under the tripod. That was so that it wouldn't get stolen. So you're saying is it possible to see it live? That depends on the camera rig. Say, it totally, it totally is possible to see it live. It just really depends upon the camera rig. There are a number of different solutions that provide automatic feedback. Um, the problem is it's, it's not always exactly the way your final output will be, so it's, it's difficult to judge. And when you do sh use a live stitcher, you need to be very aware of that may not be what it's ultimately going to be like. Um, so yes, it is, it is possible. The Ozo right now, I just, I just came from directing a three-camera Ozo shoot. We're live stitching or live switching in the field and live stitching, stereo, spatialized, VR, 360. Uh, it's a three camera shoot. One of the cameras is up on a jib. Um, it's pretty awesome, actually. It was really cool. And um, it's spatialized sound as well, all live, right away. You can put a headset on. I was directing the show, watching three monitor feeds, as well as putting, my, putting a Samsung Galaxy Gear on my face off and on. If you cover the ports inside, you can take it off without having it uh, load. Minute left. I mean, personally, that, that means you've got a big black hole at the top and bottom. Um, you could do that if you want to. Sounds cool. I mean, I, I've done stuff where I've, I've framed things, certainly. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's your preference. There's no, like, to put rules on this medium that's fairly young, or at least in its infancy now, in terms of how much of adoption is going on, I think it's foolish. Thank you. So that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm really happy Thank to be here. Right now, we have my dear friend and master trainer, Jeff Greenberg, on behalf of GenArts. Everyone, please, Jeff Greenberg. Hi, everybody. Let's just start off with this. Michael Horton says, I have 10 minutes before the giveaway. We all know Michael, we all know his career. And you see right there where it says, make sure I tell you about the gift. By the way, if anybody's got a timer, you can start your timers, because I'm gonna be done in eight minutes or less, because we need to get to the giveaway tonight. Everybody's a winner tonight in Vegas. You don't know what I mean by that? Watch this. Gen Arts is taking Sapphire FX, and giving every person in this room six months of these plugins. They're over there, they need to hear you. What do you have to do to get it? Nothing. They're gonna send it to you via email. Now do I have your attention? 
Okay, so Sapphire 8 is, gets users in broadcast, in film, in advertising. In the last 24 hours, if you've turned on a television, you've seen some of their fine plugins work. These are 250 plus plugins. They're gonna work in a bunch of our tools. Sadly, not Final Cut 10, but please note there, Resolve, Nuke, Smoke, Media Composer, After Effects. I wanna focus here. I wanna focus here because first and foremost, I am an editor. And I happen to love the way these tools make things pop for me. So most plugins work like this. You got this giant list here on the left. I love this shot. The one thing I would wanna do with this shot, put a little bit of like a lens flare on it. It's just natural. And I'm gonna to have to go and grab the lens flare, drag and drop, and I can adjust the lens flare. Got a great UI here in the interface. But the problem is, is this isn't very visual. Let's see this a little bit more. I'm gonna to go to another tool here. I'm gonna to go to Media Composer. And here we are at the Super Meet. Nice vignette here. This is a gorgeous real time of vignette for Media Composer. And I'm just gonna drag and put it right on this shot. There we go. Once again, I'm gonna get into effect mode in Media Composer. Oh, we're gonna go put it on a title. Did you know you can put effects on titles in Media Composer with Gen Arts? Don't hold down the Alt Option key. It's gonna destroy the effect. We get into effect modes. Look at this little switch. Bam, it's now working on a title on a matte media composer. So these are some of the things these tools do for you. But as I said, it's not very visual. This is the struggle, we're creatives, and we prefer to say, maybe see it like this in nice pretty pictures and backgrounds and adjustments, and it works right on our footage. So we're gonna go ahead, this is my daughter, and my wife shot this iPhone video, it's vertical. I want you to see, we're gonna take the S effect, we're gonna drop it on the shot. When we drop it on the shot in Premiere, I'm gonna go ahead and touch this button called Load Preset. And now we've got the builder, sorry, not the builder, the browser. We have the browser here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and touch the adjustment category. And we now get in the adjustment category, my daughter in all these different views, a really visual way to work and imagine with effects. Now, I need some wings on this, I need an adjustment. You can go and type in a little bit of information if you wanted, or I can go click on the word utility, and I get just the utility effects. This one is iPhone to HD. It's gonna put wings behind her. We're gonna go ahead here, bring this up. We hit load, and now she's got that nice background. This is way easier than having to build it ourselves, and it looks so good. It's my daughter, come on, aw. Good, very good. All right, I wanted to do a little bit more than even that. So, when we say that this works and you get 250 of the best lens flares and glows and creative effects, you really are gonna get infinite effects. You know what would make this better? Something like Legos, where I can make my own building blocks, where I could say I need this effect to do something more. So they include the effects builder. This effects builder is a compositor that works on nodes. This is a transition. It's going from a shot to a shot, and I'm gonna end up tweaking it a little bit for a better result. So here I am in Media Composer, and I'm gonna take the transition. It's one of their effects. We're gonna just put it right here. We're gonna go ahead, get in effect mode. When we get into effect mode in Media Composer, this is gonna give you so many more effects in Media Composer, so many gorgeous, plug it, I mean uh, transitions. I'm gonna say here, this time, edit effect. This is that node-based system I was just talking about. And it's just a straight dissolve right now. Now there's a little switch in the top. I'm gonna go ahead and press this switch. And this switch is gonna open up that same browser we saw before, but now it's on transitions. And with it on transitions, I can start looking for some gorgeous transitions here. Um, I love this group of ones. These are TV channel changes. Isn't that incredible? And it's easy because they're all nice and visual and easy to find. I'm a film guy, I went to film school. I wanna go and take a film transition, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab that. There's this nice look, looking film transition, but I need it to be a little bit green. My last name is Greenberg, so I'm gonna go grab a tint, and I'm gonna grab the tint and I'm gonna just put it between the output, the transition and the result, just like this. And with that being set that way, I'm gonna change the color to 
right in. Green is always the right answer. All right, with that up, I'm going to say OK. I'm going to go ahead and play it here. We're going to say OK. We're going to see this inside of Media Composer. It's going to play back. It is a real-time effect in Media Composer, which is wonderful. I want to show you one more build of this, a little bit more complex in Premiere. I got a blue matte background. Above this, I've got a woman on a green screen. We're going to go ahead and grab the S effect, put it on the background. There are these gorgeous backgrounds that you can put in this use, but also you can put text above this. I'm going to hit my load preset. Here are all my backgrounds. I'm going to go to this little one that's a grid over here on the right. There it is. Some of these are animated, like animated curtains. Gorgeous if you don't have that stock footage. And I'm going to just go here in Premiere's effect controls and just adjust the tilt just a little bit. There we go. Let's go ahead. I've already got on the upper clip. This is a green screen. I've already got my key done. So all I'm going to do is throw Adobe's Ultra Key there. And I'm going to grab, again, another Sapphire effect. So I'm going to grab that builder. I'm going to put it on that higher shot, because I want something a little bit more artistic, a little bit more abstract. I'm hitting Load Preset. You have favorites. As you go through and you browse, you'll find some favorites. I found this gorgeous watercolor. It's going to apply just to her. It's this nice art on top of that background. I just want a little bit more pop, a little bit more saturation. So I'm going to open up the builder, go grab Hue and Sats, drag it here, put it in. Now we can adjust it here in, directly in Sapphire, in the builder, but I'm going to do this inside of Premiere because it passes these across. And now I'm going to just go ahead and adjust her saturations just so you can really see it. Just so you can, there you go, just like that. All right. So here we are. Uh, in Sapphire, in their builder. Let's see if I got that next slide triggering. Anytime now. That, it's a visual infinite tool set. There's this gorgeous, easy to use browser for these clips. There's a builder to let you build your own. This is part of Sapphire 8. Every person in this room is going to be using it for the next six months. It works beautifully, it's easy to use. Uh, it's normally, uh, pricing is, uh, starts at $149 for three months. Uh, you should go see them tomorrow at SL5630. My name is Jeff Greenberg. I'm Jeff at J Greenberg Consulting. I'm on Twitter as FilmGeek. You should follow me on Twitter. I hope you like this. Could you let Gen Arts hear one more time how much you like? And uh, I'm done in eight minutes. On behalf of Canon, we're very happy to have with us both Canon and tonight, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Jem Schofield. How are you guys doing? Good. So a lot of people shooting. That's uh, good for me, and that makes me excited. And as uh, Dan has said, my history goes back in post training for, for a long time. And I spent a lot of time up here in Boston uh, teaching for Apple. But I'm happy to be here tonight uh, on behalf of Canon. But before I talk a little bit about the 1DX, the new camera that was announced recently, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about sort of how I got to where I am right now. And maybe just sort of have a brief discussion about some of the things you can think about as it relates to working with your clients or getting potential business. And the things that have happened to me since I started uh, the C47 and started to do production-based training and that kind of stuff. So cool? All right, so um, I started a company about mm, 16 years ago called Buttons Productions. And it is a production company. And I basically define myself as a producer and an educator. Those are the two lives that I lead. And you know, um, as a company, the stuff that we do is uh, motion graphics work. So we do a lot of stuff. When I started out in the mid-90s, I was uh, such a 90s word, a multimedia company. So I was doing website development and some other stuff. But that quickly led to starting to do video production work. And this is just sort of some of the stuff that um, I've worked on over the last few years. Tonight, I just wanted to show you guys work that was shot uh, specifically, except for the motion graphic stuff, 
on Canon uh, DSLR cameras. So all of this stuff was shot primarily on the 5D Mark II. Some of it was shot on the, the 7D. And it just sort of gives you an idea. That's because it's conformed from 30 to 24. But um, some narrative stuff. So a lot of what I do is documentary style, but I also do some narrative projects. And uh, just sort of a real mix of different things using these camera systems. And to give you guys an idea of my history uh, from a production standpoint, I started about 11 years ago as a producer. And I hired crews. And they would do things like come into a space and light the entire space without light meters, without uh, scopes, without anything. And then they would set up the camera. And then they would spend two hours fixing all of the lights that they had set up. And, uh, and I realized at that point that if I wanted to be a good producer, then I would have to learn something about production. And so that was sort of the beginning of my, my education in learning about this. And uh, at the same time, I had sort of this parallel life where I was teaching post-production, uh, largely for Apple, in uh, Final Cut Studio, Motion uh, specifically, some of the other apps, and also Aperture. So I had some history in photography and started to do more production work with, uh, with small chip cameras that started to shoot, uh, obviously, 24, one ingredient to the film look. And then quickly transitioned into using small chip cameras, but with 35 millimeter lens adapters to get selective focus. And then, of course, the 5D Mark II came out, and things changed. And, uh, and while the first big project that I shot on that camera was at 30p, and not 29.97, but 30p, if you guys remember, um, it had all the other ingredients that we were looking for in a cost-effective camera system. You know, large sensor, interchangeable lens system, the ability to have selective focus, and a camera that worked like a cinema film camera. So the same language. You know, a lot of cinematographers come from photography as a background. And I am not Rodney Charters, but uh, I'd love to work with him at some point, producing a project. But, um, but that sort of led me down this path. So I've sort of been producing and doing production work and then uh, one day, I started looking around, and I realized that for all of us, there was a lot of post-production training that existed, but there was very, very little production-based training. So just out of show of hands, wow, that's blinding. Um, how many people inside of this room, by a show of hands, have had some kind of real production-based training? How many people went to film school? Okay, so this is pretty typical. There's very few hands, but there's a lot of working professionals in this room who do a lot of creative work um, for a living. And that is what the C47 is all about. The C47 is about teaching the craft of video production and filmmaking. So that's my second life, is in education. And I started this because I realized there wasn't a lot of teaching out there for this area. So uh, it seemed like a good fit. And so now, the evolution of this has been that I do um, not only live workshops or live learning, but I also do a lot of production-based training for other clients, like Monfrotto. Um, I did 21 instructional videos for Canon's Digital Learning Center website. Six of those were for their camcorders, like the XF series there. That's a multi-camera tutorial there. Um, another one was, that's about shutter speed, so we're teaching about shutter angle. We're showing different shutter speeds. Um, so these are all free. These are all on Canon's Digital Learning Center website, and they teach a lot of stuff. Um, again, six of them for the XF series of cameras, and 15 of them for the EOS HD cameras. Uh, double system sound, learning about audio. So these things are all about five to ten minutes long, and you guys can go to the site and hopefully pick up some stuff. And, uh, and learn some things. Cool? Yes? Good. OK, cool. Wow. Um, so part of this mess that I got into was that when I started the C47, even though it's much more than just um, this, which is the website, I had the psychotic idea of doing five video podcasts every week, so one a day. And I've been doing it for almost two and a half years now. And, uh, and this one is kind of fun. That's a, uh, that's a Canon DSLR. And it is sitting, uh, the sensor plane is right above a small chip camera 
with a 35 millimeter lens adapter. They both have 50 millimeter lenses on them and it is, uh, I'm geeking out and trying to figure out what the field of view is between the two of them. That's pretty geeky, I think. Um, this one was shot today, so that was shot over there. So that's live already online. You can see that's not much different. Um, and so, so I do do this, but the real idea here is not, it's not about DSLR filmmaking. It's about the craft of video production and filmmaking. And that's what I want to focus on. And not just me, but as you saw from those clips on, uh, you know, on there, having other voices there, bringing in DPs, bringing in sound recorders, bringing in people who are experts in the industry, ACs, DITs, people who are doing things on set for episodic television, for feature films, and that's sort of phase two to just give you guys a teaser for the C-47 as far as what I'm going to be doing. So there's going to be more long form training coming up next year and that's all kind of coming together. Um, additionally, I run a program every summer called the Filmmakers Intensive. I co-produce it with Josh Apter from Manhattan Edit Workshop. It's a two week narrative filmmaking program. So it focuses strictly on narrative filmmaking and it's for all of those people in this room who didn't raise their hand when I asked them about training. It's about people who want to raise their game, people who want to have, usually we have eight to 10 instructors from all phases of production and post. And, uh, and it's an immersive nine hours of instruction every day. Uh, you live basically together. Uh, not in the same room, but you live together. And kind of hang out and you make films and really learn about the hierarchy of filmmaking. And uh, that's one that we actually originally ran in Florida. And the next one, next summer, is going to be in New York. So it'll just be outside New York City and should be pretty exciting. Cool? So um, now we talk a little bit about this. It's so mysterious, that image. Um, this is the 1DX, and you can call it X, unlike Final Cut Pro, which is 10. 10. You can't call it X, it's 10. Uh, so this is the EOS 1DX, and one thing I want to tell you guys, first of all, is that this is uh, Canon's flagship still camera. Okay, so we still have a very similar situation to what we saw with the 5D Mark II and the other DSLRs that are out there on the market. This is a flagship stills camera. But it is definitely a version two with the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about tonight, which is obviously the movie or video functions of the camera. So we're not going to get into the you know, 12 frames per second, 14 frames per second in still mode, crazy, uh, insane, uh, crazy Eddie high ISOs. Anybody from New York got that, hopefully. Um, X for extreme. X also because it's the 10th camera in this line for Canon. And uh, there's probably another 10 in there as well. I don't know what it is, but I think I saw it somewhere on the slide deck. I'm like the anti keynote person, by the way. This is very strange for me going through slides. Um, yeah, hands-on training is what I like. So, okay, so here we go. Um, it's a monster, guys. And this, remember, this is, this is number one <clears throat> of phase two. So this may or may not be the right camera system for you guys. Um, shipping in March of next year, it's about $6,800. And it is a full frame um, DSLR camera, 18 megapixel, monster of uh, insanity. And if you are a still photographer who is also going to be doing a lot of stuff in sports, and you need um, you know, incredible AF autofocus capabilities and tracking, then, uh, and you need to do video, then maybe it's the camera for you. But it is one camera system, and we'll talk about some of the features. Now, one of the things I really like about this is they've designed this camera to basically have a playback functionality on the left side, and you'll see on the right side, we're really talking about how we operate the camera. Make sense? So that's you know, split down there. You guys remember the original iPod? Anybody have one? Show of hands, come on. I did, five gig, yeah? Okay, cool. So that little dial there on the top right, that's like the, uh, you can just move around, right? So the iPod Classic. Um, so you, it's basically a silent movie control. So you're not hearing clicking, you're not picking up sounds when you're using that. And you can control the following things during shooting, as if I need to read it to you. Shutter speed, aperture, ISO speed, exposure compensation. You're not going to use that. And sound recording level. 
So very cool stuff and uh, really, really a nice addition. Hopefully that will make it into other camera systems in the future. Um, audio recording, I'm gonna say this from an experience standpoint. We're still rarely going to use these cameras for production-based audio, okay? So we're still gonna probably do double system sound. But in those situations where you might be doing a little video podcast with a Rode VideoMic Pro or something like that, um, it might be nice to have some meters, I'm just saying, up on the screen, so you have them. Um, you can actually change those levels as you're recording, so you do have a way to actually visually monitor your audio levels with the camera. So that's definitely a nice addition, okay? Dual CF cards could be nice. I think for me the biggest feature here is redundancy, built-in backup. The ability to have that data copied over to the other card um, I haven't seen a working model yet. You guys might know of a show called Photo Plus Expo down in New York, started today. Uh, I think there's eight of these cameras, maybe 10 in 20. existence. 20. And how many of them are in New York, Dan? 20. 20. <laughs> so I get slideshows. But um, we, we get increased storage capacity, obviously. Um, so it's a really nice feature to have that dual card slot. And They've figured out a way to get around the EU so that four gigabyte file size limit is gone. We now can, on a DSLR, Canon DSLR, record uh, just under 30 minutes. If you guys are pressing start and going for more than 30 minutes, it's definitely not the right camera system for you. But a half an hour of recording is a lot of recording time. Um, this stuff on the left hand side, where we talk about all I and IPB record time, um, that's something we're going to talk about right now. But you'll see there's a menu up here where you can go in and choose your resolution, your frame rate, and you can choose what type of compression the camera is using. So it's a big step. Even with the IPB, that is also an evolution on the uh, long gop recording structure that is used in the current line of Canon DSLRs. Um, if that was Charlie Brown, don't worry. It just means it's better as far as that. Uh, two compression formats can be selected. So this is um, a big deal for editors. If we're, we're not getting, I know there's a little sad face here, we're not getting a live uh, clean HDMI out of this camera. I'm telling you right now, so don't get your hopes up. But what we are getting is we're getting two compression choices. So if we are recording to those CF cards and we want to edit this stuff, it's much, much easier to edit stuff that has full frames of video. Every single frame is a full frame of video. It's the reason we transcode from H.264 or from MPEG-2 to something like ProRes, because we want to get every frame into basically a full frame of video. So this camera is going to have an option where you can actually record intra frames. Okay, it's still using H.264, but has anybody ever used a convergent design box before? You know, there's, it's part of the spec, so you can do iframe. Um, so it's going to be larger files, but should be easier for editing. And then we have uh, an evolved version of the compression that we see right now inside of the current DSLRs, which is an IPB uh, intraframe. So we've got basically predictive frames, bidirectional frames, and we usually have one of those iframes, full frame of video, usually every 12 or 15 frames. You guys know about that stuff, I think. We've been messing with it for a long time now. Um, so that's pretty cool. Time code, big deal. Free run, record run, so we can set it up to time of day if we want. We can go ahead and start, stop, time code. Look, hours, minutes, seconds, frames. Ooh, ah, let me hear an ooh. ooh. Let me hear an ah. ah. There you go, okay, good. And this is the cool part. This is the real OO. We have an Ethernet port. And we can transfer when you're done recording your files. But we can also look, time sync between cameras. Oh. Wow, that's, yeah, I see. That's pretty cool. Higher sensitivity to be expected. I mean, we don't come out with new DSLRs and have lower sensitivity. So I think we're, but in video mode, we're going to be able to go to higher ISOs. And some of this stuff is pretty amazing that I've seen coming out of the camera. Um, and this is a big one. Um, I've seen, uh, as far as just little video shots, improved rolling shutter. Um, they've really engineered the stills part of this camera so that byproducts in the video uh, part of it are really getting picked up. So that Moray stuff, 
uh, going away, largely, color artifacts. <coughs> the way it's reading from that 18 megapixel sensor is different than it does in the current line of Canon DSLRs. So we should see um, a, a vast improvement or elimination of a lot of the problems that we're seeing with the current crop, first generation DSLRs of video. Remember, not designed originally for us, designed for Reuters and the Associated Press. 30 actual frames of video per second. Obviously all your EF lenses, right? Um, again, another mysterious photograph. And then I'm just saying, I don't know, it's Thursday, October 27th right now. Next week is November 3rd. Maybe something's going to happen. And that's it, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff Schofield, thank you very much. Moving on, it gives me great pleasure to let one of our founding charter sponsors be with us tonight here in London. Ladies and gentlemen, from my own hometown in Boston, Gen Arts and Todd Preeves. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks for the intro. It's great to be here. You know, we've been to so many super meets over the years, and it's nice to actually finally be able to present in front of a group of people. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is Todd Priebus, and I'm from Gen Arts. And just a quick show of hands, before tonight, how many of you have heard of Sapphire plugins? Okay. So let me just start by giving you an overview of Gen Arts and Sapphire plugins, and then the new product that we're releasing uh, and announcing tonight. So Sapphire plugins have been used for nearly 15 years in most major theatrical releases for feature films, television commercials, and big budget projects. You can see our glow here is used in Iron Man. And I, as I go through the list here, we have quite a few of the world's top video creators using our software on a day-to-day -day basis to help them with their visual effects and engage their audience. Now, they're typically visual effects in, in feature films and big budget commercials, but really the spectrum has grown. So something like this, you'd see uh, a, a film like Star Trek has got 95% of the shots have visual effects. But as we move into the other mediums out there, things that you wouldn't necessarily think have visual effects are actually ripe with them. Independent films such as Slumdog Millionaire, television nightly news, and, and even talk shows like Oprah Winfrey. I mean, they're all using visual effects to help them engage their audience and tell their story. And uh, many of you out there today, I would think most of you, are also telling stories uh, and want to deliver the same quality and the same level to engage your audience. So people are not only doing things for TV and for film, but there's a growing video market out there. Uh, many of you making videos for Facebook, for Vimeo, for YouTube, um, doing wedding videography, doing industrial video, doing corporate video. So what we're trying to do with our new product that we're announcing tonight is help you further engage your audience through the use of visual effects, but really in a streamlined fashion that helps you as the editor get really nice results. So this is our world premiere announcement tonight of Sapphire Edge. And Sapphire Edge, as I mentioned, was built specifically from the feedback from video editors and videographers, people who are very busy, who have tight budgets and tight turnaround time, but want to develop the same high quality looks and deliver their clients the same high quality projects that clients are used to seeing uh, in, in, on television or in big budget productions. So Sapphire Edge is built from the Sapphire plugins engine, but it's really streamlined to help you get really nice, easy results. So I'm going to go ahead and move to my demo inside of Final Cut and show you exactly what I mean. And this is the fun part for me. I get to actually play with the toys. Um, but Sapphire Edge, what it does is it gives you a streamlined interface. It gives you a preset library of many, many looks to choose from and deploy quickly to your footage. And it also gives you a library of new looks that are refreshed every single month via a new website we're launching called FX Central. So I'm just going to go into this here and uh, play a little bit of this back for you and then show you how Sapphire Edge works inside of Final Cut Pro. This is a spec spot that was done um, for a vineyard in Seattle called Coho Vineyards. And I'm just going to play a few frames of it and then show you how you can use Sapphire Edge to enhance your storytelling and your editorial process really quickly and really easily. So I'm, again, I'm just going to play back a few frames here, and then we'll get to work actually using the plugins themselves. There we go. So we've got a couple different shots here. This is just a, a raw editorial. There are no uh, visual effects applied to it. But I want to use some of the tools in Sapphire Edge to help me really enhance the look to this. So the first part of this sequence talks about uh, the vineyards when it was first found at the turn of the century. So wh I, what I can do is go to my Effects tab here. I can go to my Video Filters. And as I scroll down to my Sapphire Edge filters, you'll see I have four different filters. But within that, I literally have hundreds of looks. 
So the first filter I want to apply is a film style. And this is going to give me a, a filmatic look to my footage by adding some color correction, some grain, some glow. So when I go ahead and I drop film style on here, we can instantly see the result, how it's adjusting the footage and give me a really nice film, uh, film type look. So when I go to my video filters controls, you'll see, as I mentioned before, it's a really streamlined interface. They're not uh, an overwhelming amount of parameters that maybe you have to fiddle with to get different looks and can be confusing. But you've got a really straightforward set of easy to use parameters. So I can start by adjusting the, the amount of the film style. And as I turn that up, it's going to intensify it. And vice versa, I can go ahead and take that down and soften it up a little bit. And I've got various other controls that would be essential for doing a film type of color correction, like saturation. I can maybe pull out a little bit of the color and so on and so forth. But the real magic to Sapphire Edge is the fact that we built all these presets for you so you can really quickly and easily apply looks to your footage. So to do that, all I simply do is click on the Load Preset button, and we'll wait for the preset browser to launch. And again, here's where the, where the magic comes out. We've got all these presets that are built ahead of time for you, and you can either mouse through these or scroll through them with your, uh, with your keyboard and see all these different looks, and it's applying to the actual place where your playhead is in your timeline. So you're getting a, essentially a real-time preview of what the effect is going to look like. And this ships with hundreds, so you have many different looks, and they're also really well tagged and organized. So as I mentioned before, in this particular sequence at the beginning of the shot, it talks about the vineyard being found at the turn of the century. So what I could do is go to my time tags, look through here, find 1900s, and then uh, play with some of these. I think Withered Husk actually looks pretty nice. So that would be sort of the perfect effect to use for this particular sequence. I simply load that, and it's applied it to my clip. So there's not a whole lot of fiddling around with a, a lot of unnecessary parameters to get a look. You can simply load a preset and move on from there. So I want to show you another example of a, a Sapphire Edge filter. I'm going to show you the lens flare this time. Uh, same process where I can go ahead and drag and drop the lens flare on the grape. In this particular uh, sequence, where we are honoring the grape as the, uh, as the dialogue goes. I'll spare you from having to listen to the dialogue because it's a little over the top. But uh, I can, again, control my basic uh, parameters of my lens flare. I can position it wherever I want. But the real magic here is going to the preset browser and having a quick view of all the different lens flares that are built for me that I don't have to spend time fiddling about with, but instead I can just directly apply to my clip maybe do a few manipulations and move on to the next shot. So I can, again, scroll through some of these to find something I like. In this case, I think Blue Starburst is kind of a cool one. I can go ahead and load that. And it's then applied directly to my clip. Uh, the same sort of thing works with transitions. So we have 14 video transitions that come in Sapphire Edge, but again, hundreds of looks. So as I go up and I want to just do a transition between these two clips, I can go to my Sapphire Edge filters. In video, sorry, my Sapphire Transitions, in Video Transitions, and you can see all the different transitions. I'll take a Dissolve Bubble. Let's go ahead and drag and drop that between two clips. Let's drag it between these two clips. And of course, if I wanted to, I can frame preview through this to see how the transition's gonna look. But the, the great thing about the preset editor, again, is that, in fact, it's going to, or the preset browser, rather, the preset browser is gonna play these transitions back for me. So I can double click on my transition, click on Load Preset, and the same sort of idea happens here, where I have all these pre-built presets. And it's really nice that it's actually doing an A-B dissolve for me and showing me what the transition is going to look like. So the same idea, very quickly and very easily, I can go through these, pick a transition I like, and then let's say I uh, like hibernation. Go ahead and load that. So it's now applied directly to my clip. So that's the principle of Sapphire Edge. Again, it's a streamlined user interface that allows you to quickly and easily adjust various parameters. It's a robust preset browser. And uh, what we're also offering is uh, a subscription when you purchase the product to FX Central. And FX Central is our website that, um, that's going to be updated every month with new presets. So even when you first acquire the package, you're getting about 400 or so different looks. But every month, we're going to be adding to that with new presets for all the different effects. So you're really able to build your library and build your starting point very easily and very quickly once you're using Sapphire Edge. And of course, I want to. Um, get out of this and show you some, uh, some other cool stuff we have in here with um, FCPX, but I'll get to that in one sec. Um, a little bit of background about Sapphire Edge. Uh, it's priced at $299, a very affordable price. Uh, and with that, it includes a one-year subscription to FX Central, which, as I mentioned, is going to be offering downloads every month of new presets that you can add to your existing looks. And as I said, this is our world premiere tonight where we're first announcing it. So if you want more information, you can go to the website on our screen here or you can come out to our table, which is right outside, and I'll be showing it additionally after the break. So when we, we, we first uh, release it, we are offering a two-week trial, so you can use it in your projects, use it watermark-free, and really get a good sense of how it looks.
So let me jump out of that and jump into FCPX because I know there's been a lot of speculation as to if plugins are going to work in, if, or not and, and what the deal is that with that. But I'm really happy to announce that we uh, have Sapphire Edge and plan to support Final Cut Pro 10 as well. So you can see here we have the Sapphire Edge filters. A little round of applause. Gen Arts engineers doing a good job. Final Cut Pro X. I always wanted that on stage. I, I, feel, I feel fulfilled. But um, you can see here we have the, uh, the Sapphire Edge effects. Uh, the interface is a little bit different where, the, in this case, the, uh, the thumbnails are actually right in the application. But I can go through these. And uh, I'm looking at film damage in particular here. And film damage is going to add uh, artifacts and things you'd find in typically aged film. And I can look at all these different thumbnails um, of what the different film damage presets are going to look like. Let's say I like Fuzzy Vidalia. I can go ahead and drag and drop that on my clip. And it's now applied that. And when I go to my uh, inspector here, you'll see I've got the Fuzzy Vidalia parameter. So um, we're really happy to announce that we are planning on supporting Final Cut Pro X. And of course, we uh, support Final Cut Pro 7 as well. If there are any, any Windows people out there, uh, Sapphire Edge is also available for Sony Vegas. Um, but I wanted to wrap up, given my limited time, by showing a video that one of our beta testers, who's here in the audience tonight, Alan McCormick, made. Uh, and it was a, just a, a 30 second before and after showing how he uh, had the untreated edit and then how he used Sapphire Edge and just used all the default, or all the presets rather, to get a really nice look. So I'm just going to jump over and um, play Alan's clip. And then uh, you'll give me another round of applause, and I'll be on my way. <laughs> so this is a, a spot again from Alan McCormick, who's here tonight. So we, we thank him for, uh, for that. So you'll see the before and then the after. Ben asked me, don't talk too much about bits and bytes. So here we go. Let's talk about my favorite pair of boxer shorts. I love them. They fit perfectly. They're the best I ever had. And I would even say they're my lucky pair of boxer shorts. I wear them today. I'll show you later. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> so um, who of you also have lucky boxer shorts? So OK, great. I'm not the only one. Now, with these boxer shorts, I've, I've got them for a long time. I should get rid of them. But I really love them, and I'm reluctant to let go. Now. Lucky box shorts are important also for you, eh? because at the end of the session, we have two great prizes. So I hope you're wearing them. And um, if you wonder why the story about boxer shorts, well, uh, I'm working for the European Workstation Group, or high performance platforms. And uh, I meet a lot of uh, uh, customers, organizations, who are now on a platform that they really love. But there are some very good reasons to let go and to move to something that will bring a lot more performance and reliability. But it's hard to change. It's hard to change for me. And sometimes it's good to look a little bit at the benefits. So in the next few minutes, I want to spend some time introducing the workstations to you and also to bring out a customer here on stage that will share their journey of change. Now, with HP workstations, luck is not a factor. They are designed to perform. Let me introduce you to one of the family members. This is the HP Z1. It's an all-in-one device. And it comes with the best-in-class processors, memory, and it's also certified to run with the software that you use in your business. So we work closely with Avid, Adobe, Autodesk to make sure you get the most performance uh, out there. Here we go. So you can also open up all of our workstations and upgrade the components in there, change them easily. If you want to go to new graphics, no need to buy something new. Open it up and change the components in there. Is that cool? Do you like that? Yeah. So you will find these workstations in uh, your environments where a lot of performance is needed. And uh, this is a picture courtesy uh, of our dear customer, DreamWorks, which uses uh, our Z820, which is the most computing performance you can put on someone's desk. And they use that for their animation work. Now, we're pushing uh, the envelope with this, uh, with this machine. Uh, last week, we introduced the Z840. And uh, you will be able to benefit, uh, when that's released, of uh, 36 cores and up to 2 terabytes of memory. So not storage, memory in there. So that's the performance, that's the power you need to get some of your work done. Now, performance is one thing, but reliability is the other. So by um, testing way beyond the industry standard, we make sure that our workstations are ready to operate 24-7, year in, year out. And that's important when you need to deliver on your next deadline, but it's also important when you're 
doing, doing your work up there in that tower. So you can either then work with the workstation technology or of course alternatively count on your lucky boxer shorts. So think of me when you're boarding your plane uh, in some time from now. Now, this combination of performance and reliability that's unique to uh, HP. And you'll find that throughout our whole product line from the entry level Z200 series way up to the Z800 series where you get all the performance in place. And that combination has resulted in a very good acceptance by the market. And this might come as a surprise to some of you, but we actually have about 50% market share in most of the European uh, countries. So, did that surprise you? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> That's what I like. Now, this is a lot about HP and the benefits in, in the workstation series, but I think it's good to hear of uh, one of our customers. And um, let me introduce you to a couple who is no stranger to change. And I will do that by running the intro of their TV series. He's Patrick. And she's Kylie. We both <laughs> Apologies if that made you feel slightly nauseous. It's <laughs> completely normal. <laughs> look, um, when you see that trailer, it does look a little bit Disney, a little bit corny. And you think, yeah, it sounds a bit scripted. But that is exactly what happened to us. I mean, I had a really good career, a regular salary, uh, a proper job in an office, and, uh, and quit everything, abandoned it to run away and live in Italy. And I had this idea. I thought, look, I, you know, food, television, it's great, but I don't want to be just cooking inside a controlled environment in a kitchen that's boring. You know, I wanted to basically do Jamie Oliver meets James Bond, because I have a weakness for James Bond. So I thought, look, I want to put in helicopters and fast cars and high-speed motorbikes and, you know, horses and be, you know, really running around and making this uh, the type of show where when you come home after a long day in an office and you're tired, you switch it on and you watch this episode, and it makes you want to quit your job, leave your partner, get on a plane, and run away and be as irresponsible as we are. And, um, and you know what? I thought it was a really good idea, but uh, nobody else agreed. And I moved to Italy and knocked on people's doors for three years. Everyone said, you're crazy. You know, you've got no experience. This is a big budget idea. You can't do that. And uh, just, you know, start small or, or just forget about it, basically. And I thought, no, no, there's got to be a way. If you've got enough enthusiasm and enough creativity, you can, you can make this happen. I know you can. And anyway, finally, I found this tiny little production company in Rome who said yes. And, um, and I found, by chance, Patrick's uh, video blog. And I said, you know, this seems really crazy. Do you want to fly out tomorrow, meet me in Rome? We're going to shoot a pilot for a TV series. You've never heard of me, but I think it's going to be a global success. And um, fortunately, he said yes. And uh, you know, a few days later, we shot the pilot. It got picked up. And now it's airing in 68 countries across Discovery, National Geographic, Sky, Fox, and a whole heap of other networks. Which I guess sounds as though maybe it's quite straightforward and quite a linear process, but it really wasn't. And when we got there on the first day of shooting, I remember meeting the camera guys in particular for the first time. And they were used to shooting something that was a lot more scripted. They'd been working on soap operas, whereas what we had in mind was essentially run-and-gun food porn. And um, that was quite a lot for them to get their heads around. And so we spent a lot of time behind the camera as well, trying to coax them and, and, and tell them what we had seen in food television, the kind of modern food television that's out there. But the one thing that we couldn't control because we didn't have the technical knowledge was the editing process. So once the show was finished and we decided, you know, what, what are we going to do for our next project, we thought we want to take control of it. We want to be able to do everything ourselves. We want to be able to film and we want to be able to understand the editing process and, and do that too. So we started editing. We, we threw ourselves into it a couple of years ago using uh, Final Cut Pro on, on a Mac and, and away we went. And, you know, I think every one of us has like a, you know, some crazy concept that you think, look, if only I had the funding for this or the time or, or you know, the freedom, the creative freedom. Uh, but, you know, I think you just got to get out there and do whatever you can now, because otherwise you'll never make, you'll never make that project, you know. So uh, we did that with, the, with this series. 
And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm literally on the phone to the head of the network in Canada saying, yeah, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. Yeah, we're, we're hosting it and we're shooting it and I'm editing it, but, but don't worry, we'll deliver it, it's fine. And, uh, and then freaking out because editing it was an absolute nightmare. Yeah, I mean, a complete nightmare for both of us. Kylie's editing it, but this computer is literally wheezing like an 80-year-old man with emphysema and it's, there's rendering hell, there were crashes, and, and we became very familiar with that beach ball of death, uh, the Death Star, and it has many names with many people, but um, it was a very emotional experience. But, you know, it, it gave us confidence. We thought, no, we've just got to, we've got to work harder. We've got to get more knowledge and, uh, and, and, and aim a little bit higher as well. So next project, I was, uh, did a, a travel series in Italy all on my own because I thought, yeah, I can't afford uh, a crew, so I'm just going to go and do it by myself, strapped all my film equipment to my waist on a bicycle. Uh, it was also raining, so I was holding an umbrella with my SLR hanging off my, uh, off my shoulder. So it was a challenge, but you know, again, we're thinking, no, it's, you just gotta, you gotta get out there and do it. So. I, I think at this point though, we <laughs> had realized that our creative desire and, and excitability to create something incredible was outstripping what we could do uh, technologically. And that's when we spoke to the guy's uh, escape technology, a guy called Paul Snell, who was, who was the nicest guy. And he came up with a controversial suggestion that we should look at the, the Z Series workstations. Now, we, we said, yeah, okay, come on, we'll, we'll meet with you, we'll chat about it. But when we went, we were, we were really skeptical. I mean, we had a, a completely different workflow, and you know, we were essentially part of a, another, another cult. And, um, and so we went along and, you know, we were interested to hear what he said, but we weren't sure if we were gonna go for it. But then you, you start actually hearing another side of the story, and you start hearing about the, the big production companies who are using this technology, and that, you know, they were using it for, for that reason, that, it, that it's reliable and that it's fast, and that was something that we realized that we needed. Particularly for my next project, because, um, you know, I had production companies approach me and say, yeah, you know, do you want to do this show in Italy because you're based there and you've got all these crazy contacts and, and uh, you know, we want to do it in this very conservative way. And I thought, no, I want to film the real in Italy. I want it to be spontaneous. I want it to be, to be exciting. And, and, and what I found was going around, you know, I get these cool characters like some, you know, mafia dude in Sicily. He would close up because there's a big film crew around. I thought, if I'm on my own, imagine how flexible I can be. So I've, for the last four months, been shooting um, in the south of Italy, tiny little village, all on my own. And, you know, I, I strap a five kilo tripod to my back. You know, I've got all my film equipment out with me every single day. I'm like climbing mountains, hanging out with millionaires and shepherds and, and parties on rooftops. It's, it's exhausting, but I'm so excited. The only thing is though, when I get to the post-production, it gets scary because I've made these promises to these international networks and I didn't want to be on the phone saying to them, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll deliver it on that day, trust me, but not knowing if I've got the power or the reliability to, to get it out there. It sounds like a line, but trust me, it's, it's scary because it's intimidating to talk to a Discovery or a National Geographic. And that's for me, that's what it came down to. I was, I was really reticent to, to shift over because your computer is, is, is so intimate. And if you're, if you're an editor, I know I spend like 16 hours a day just there, one spot, not talking to another human being. And, and not, it's not even me. <laughs> it's, you know, it is. It's hard to shift over. But at, yeah, in the end, I, I want to deliver and I want to be audacious with my projects. I want to promise big things. And, and so it's just about being able to say, yeah, I'll deliver it and it will be done and it will be beautiful. Meanwhile, I've been in London for the last three months filming a vegetable soup with a C100 and a macro lens. Um, the next project that I'm going to do is an online cooking school. It's 130 videos. And I really wanted to film something that was cinematic, completely different to everything that's out there at the moment. And again, I've got to deliver this by Christmas, and I can't afford to be waiting around. So that's why you know, I'm using the workstation, and Kylie has... Um, has that's, the portable that's my editing solution. suite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this changes everything. I mean, suddenly an editing suite isn't in a building somewhere. It can be on a balcony in, in Positano, apparently. And so, you know, that's why we've made the transition. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it is a transition, you know. It can, it can take some time and there is a learning curve. But the fact is, once you get over that learning curve, 
then you, know, you have the reliability to back you up and it makes all the difference. And I hope that we can um, share that with you later this year. I guess the one thing I would say to, to wrap it up for me, the analogy I always think of is that essentially what we're doing now, it's like the difference between a, a great restaurant and a bad restaurant. Because when I go to a good restaurant, I don't even know the inner workings of it. I don't know what's going on in the kitchen. And, and these amazing plates of food just seem to appear in front of me, and then the empty plate disappears as well. And the only thing I'm focusing on is, is enjoying the experience. And I think, really, it's the same with what we're doing now. I don't have to think about whether the inner workings are going are gonna to back up what I'm doing. I'm just focusing 100% on creativity, and that's exactly where we want to be. So... We hope that uh, you know, we'll, we'll be showing it to you guys perhaps this time next year. And if you want to follow the rest of the adventure, then you can find us on pretty much any social media outlet imaginable. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick and Carly, for this remarkable story about uh, change. Now, if you want to learn about more case uh, studies, for people that made uh, the switch and stepped uh, over to the HP technology, just go to our website, hp.com, set workstations, and you will also find some nice comparisons on performance, and you will also see some very interesting price points. Okay? Now, if you're ready to change, just reach out, send us a message, and I'll make sure that we connect to you in your country. So, just send me a line. And now, prices. So, the NVIDIA K4200, the latest card. Everybody who got in here before 6 p.m., find your white ticket. Find your white ticket. Find the white ticket. Not the red tickets, the white ticket. Do you all understand? The white ticket. Raise your hand because I can't see you. Okay, you all, all right. Do you, are, do you all have your white ticket available? because we are going to give away an NVIDIA card and an HP ZBook 15 right now. Get your white ticket out. All right, let's go ahead. We are going to have the honor of having you choose the winning raffle ticket number. There we go. This is super this is Dig the, deep. <laughs> if it's my number, it's gonna be really awkward. <laughs> this is the K4200 NVIDIA graphics card. Okay, and? ready? The winner is seven, six, four, three, five, six. Where there is the go. winner? We have a winner. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. There we go. We just okay. <laughs> okay, it's all good. It's all good. That's excellent. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, so okay. I think the cool thing now is that we're going to have everyone stand up. Who's got a winning? Who's got a white ticket? Please, everyone, stand up because as we read the number, those that don't have that number, we ask to sit down. And this is the fun part because eventually there will, there shall be only one. So last and best, we got a ZBook 15. That's all the power of a desktop workstation in a mobile envelope. So you get all the professional graphics, the memory processor, Thunderbolt is on there. So let's have a look. Who is our winner? Let's read the ticket uh, one at a time. Seven, whoa, six. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're not allowed to say the things. Who's, who's got seven? Okay, who's got six? Who doesn't? Sit down. Keep going. Four. This doesn't seem to be working right. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Five. Five. Okay, those that don't have Here we go. Zero. Zero. Ooh, getting close. Seven. Oh. <laughs> hey, wow. congratulations. Awesome. <laughs> we are starting the show off right with our friend from London, Simon Walker for Red Giant Software. Thanks, everyone. Um, Red Giant Software has offered me to present a film that they've made. And they've teamed up with a hip young director from the States called Seth Worley. Red Giant Software, if you don't know, make software plugins so that they, they do the sorts of things that um, extend the software programs. So they make plugins for color corrections that Final Cut can't do or that Final Cut can't do as fast. 
And the whole thing is that they're very proud of doing a work on big Hollywood movies. They're very proud that um, these big movies use their plugins. But they also wanted to show that you could use these tools on smaller programs. And this film that they produce is kind of a, a preview or sneak peek, if you will. I know it's tradition to have a sneak peek at these super meets, but the film lasts about nine minutes or so. And I'll talk a little bit. Ben, the lead actor, is a teenager. By the way, I was chatting with some people out in the foyer beforehand, and apparently some of us are still using Final Cut Pro 7. So, I know. But um, the filmmakers used Final Cut 7 to edit the movie, and they used Magic Bullet Looks and Magic Bullet Suite to do some of the grading effects. So, in honor of that, I'm going to use Final Cut 7. Plus, I know it works. Anyway, what they planned to do was to kind of refer to some of their favorite movie genres. And they did this by scripting them in that particular style, but also by combining a number of filmic techniques. One of the issues is how do you film it? How do you do the camera movement? And uh, like for the action scenes at the beginning, these were based on an um, 80s action movie where the camera doesn't move so much. And then the noir scenes have these kind of interesting, odd, quirky camera angles. And then you've got the science fiction scene, which is all movement. The camera's moving all the time. And so they were kind of hinting at these particular genres. And that was the point. They were doing this on no budget, filming over a long weekend, um, using a Canon 7D as the camera, and borrowing kit where they could. But they wanted to make it look and feel like a much bigger movie, much more expensive movie. And one of the techniques they used was to color grade it. For example, for the action movie scenes, these guys used Magic Bullet Looks, which is a plug-in for Final Cut and Premiere in Motion and After Effects, and quite possibly Final Cut 10. The engineers have said they're working on it. The idea is that um, they can apply these color looks to a, a series of clips that helps interpret what the footage looks like, or at least their version of the films. They watched these things on VHS in the 80s. So as, as well as adding a kind of purplish tint, they're using the tools in Magic Bullet Looks to add a little bit of film grain to kind of simulate that VHS-ness, if you like, of the movie. For the sci-fi section, they realized that lots of modern sci-fi has this really kind of greeny, bluey look, especially it's green and blue in the shadows and the mid-tones. But the skin tones are still quite accurate. They're still quite orangey. So they used a plugin called Magic Bullet Mojo for doing this. And there you go. There's your instant sci-fi look. This is fun. How, how sci-fi do you want it, Mr. Client? Do you want it really sci-fi? Do you want it a little warmer, a bit more Resident Evil, perhaps? Or no, we'll, we'll keep it cooler, and perhaps you want to punch, punch up the contrast a little bit? This is where you, um, you convince your client that you've slaved all day to do this look. The point is that these are techniques built on the sorts of things that you would do with the traditional color wheel, but they're built into a tool that enables you to do things much faster. So they're still technically accurate, it's just in an interface that speeds things up. And for the, the romance section, they knew they had to come up with like this um, really warm, diffused lighting effect. So they used Magic Bullet Looks for this. And they were able to combine these tools, use a bit of diffusion, use a bit of coloring to get this kind of warm effect. But um, as well as having lots of tools inside the program, you've got lots of presets. And so they were able to use a series of presets to just um, speed up their process. So did I mention the fact that they use my presets on this film? <laughs> the whole point of this is that it speeds up time. Red Giant have got a bunch of presets that you can download from their website, which helps you accelerate the production process. So then they scripted the movie, they stood out in the rain, they, they filmed it, they produced it, they edited it, they post-produced it, but they used my presets, so you know, I give them some credit. The thing is that it's designed to save you time. If you wanted to ask me a little bit more about the movie, or if you want to go and find out a bit more about the director, to go to zethworley.com or redgiantsoftware.com. Today they'll have a making of video, and they've got lots more information about the film. But I'm also out on the Red Giant table, so if you want to ask me about this or any other of the plugins that Red Giant make. And I do a series of training in Final Cut and Final Cut Studio and in Adobe Software. And also do some training in the Magic Bullets plugins themselves. So you can have a chat with the people on the Ravensbourne table as well. But if you want free training, you can follow me on twitter.com. And I post, often post free little training clips about how you can do stuff and how you can do certain techniques. Thank you very much.